All right, great. Looks like we are live. Sorry, everybody, for the delays. Um, we had some technical issues, and our host, Brianna, um, her computer went down. So it's just going to be the three um, guests today. Um, so I can start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Jack Hansen. I'm a city councilor in Burlington, and I also coordinate the internship program for Sustainable Transportation Vermont. Um, and with me is the Lieutenant Governor, David Zuckerman, and my fellow city councilor, um, Jane Stromberg. Um, so we're just gonna get it kicked off, and if Brianna's computer starts working again, hopefully she can join us. But otherwise, we'll just get into the conversation, and folks can um, post any questions or comments that they have, and we'll be able to see those on our end, and we can, we can respond to you there. Um, so we're going to just start off with an opening question, if you both could just introduce yourself um, and what got you initially interested in sustainable transportation. Um, and let's start with Councillor Jane Stromberg. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jack. That was a nice intro. Um, this is a beautiful day to do this. I think a nice rainy day is always nice to justify being inside behind a screen. Um, so. I have been interested in sustainability and renewable energy my entire life. My father owned a solar company in New York for quite a few years, and uh, I had grown up sailing and, and doing a lot of outdoor things that didn't involve em emissions as much. And so I was kind of biased and trained in that way as a human being to take part in activities that didn't really... Um, have to do with um, a lot of fuel usage and um, just kind of a focus on sustainability. But I do actually, and I was really reflecting on this before this meeting, I very clearly remember my first ever thought that led to this interest specifically. And so when I was younger, I was in the car with my dad and he was very adamant about putting on the like the air recirculation in the car um, when we'd get behind like a big truck with a trail of black smoke behind it. And um, when I was finally like old enough to talk, my dad, um, I asked my dad like, why, like, why is that truck leaking black air? Like, what is going on here? Why is that normal? <laughs> and he explained very carefully to a six year old at the time that some cars and trucks uh, run on diesel fuel and how it's incredibly bad for the environment and that he didn't want us to breathe it in the car. And that's why he put on the air recirculation. So I proceeded to like, actually prod my father about this because I was genuinely disturbed by the fact that that was kind of a normal thing um, and and like wanted to know why this fuel exists and why we use it and he basically was just like the internal combustion engine and capitalism and the American mm -hmm. dream and so I was just very um, I guess disturbed by this and didn't quite understand it. And he basically said, and this is a very key thing, he said, if we didn't drastically change what we do day to day, like as a people, as Americans, as a globe, it won't matter if we put on the air research um, because the conditions for our atmosphere regardless are gonna just be so awful and there's never gonna be a real escape. And granted, I was six years old and I heard this and really was sitting there thinking about it. And so Vermont to me is such an amazing project in and of itself because we have this strange culture where we have normalized the, the grand car commute from Montpelier to Burlington and what have you. Um, and I have a lot of professors or had a lot of professors when I was in school that would commute from Virgins more than three times a week just to teach up at UVM. And that to me was just so interesting and, and disturbing, but also understandable. But I'm like, how do we curb that? So um, that, yeah, that's a little uh, nugget into why I have been so involved as a human being on this topic. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jane. I had no idea about about that story and how you got such a, a young start on thinking about these issues. Um, and next, we'll go to the Lieutenant Governor, David Zuckerman, who's also the, can the Democratic and Progressive candidate for Vermont governor. Um, thanks so much. We're really, we're really happy to have you here, um, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman, and appreciate it. And yeah, I'd love to hear your sort of origin story or what initially got you interested in sustainable transportation issues. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I I uh, don't have a moment in story like Jane does. That's pretty powerful um, yeah. to have that conversation when you're six years old. Um, but I've, I've definitely thought a lot about transportation over the years. Um, I came to Vermont to go to UVM. And I guess one of the interesting stories, and you'll, you'll wonder how this isn't a backward story, but hear me out. Um, when I was at UVM at first in 89, I, I spent a year and a half as a chemistry major and I was an environmental studies minor. And I definitely was learning about agriculture impact on the environment, uh, transportation, uh, you know, heating and air conditioning and so forth, and sort of just our, our collective impacts. But I also was discovering that I probably didn't really want to be a chemistry major. And I was very involved in environmental activism with a, a club at school called VSTEP, Vermont Student Environmental Program. And, uh, but I also was a bit extracurricular in other ways and realized I should take some time off from school and really focus on what do I want to be and so forth before I continue on in my studies uh, and really want to use those resources well. And I, I took a year and I, I lived at my mom's place in rural Virginia for part of it. And I hiked the Appalachian Trail. So I walked from Northern Georgia uh, up into central Maine over the course of five and a half months. And uh, that was a very reflective time for me. I was, um, it was seven years after my dad had died. I had thought I was going into chemistry because I wanted to be a doctor like my dad. And I was just evaluating like, who are we? Who am I? What do I want to be? And when I got back to UVM, there was a new shuttle bus system for busing students all over campus. So when I had been there, we would all walk across campus. We would bike across campus. We would, uh, you know, get the class on our own. And I got back and thought, well, what do we need buses to drive people? What is a 15 minute walk? Like this is ridiculous. And they too were belching out diesel, I believe at the top of their stacks and so forth. And I helped organize back in 1992, 93, a very wide campus wide effort to cut back on the shuttle buses. Now, some of the students weren't very happy. They're like, dude, I can get 15 minutes more sleep before going to class. Um, and others had very legitimate concerns about nighttime safety and walking across campus or people with injuries. And I said, okay, let's cut back on the shuttles, uh, but maybe have an on-demand bus, you know, shuttle, smaller shuttle service for people that are walking home alone at night or people who have knee injuries or you know issues so they could get to class um, rather than having just constantly looping buses around campus when people come to UVM to uh, in part because it's near skiing, it's near the lake, it's near all these outdoor activities. I'm like, well, then you're physically active. You can get across campus. So plenty of people will be frustrated with me for that, but it really led to me questioning um, transportation as a whole. You know. Where do we not need it or where could we have less of it? And where do we need it in a public or bus or collective way? And um, I've been intrigued by this conversation for years because especially when we look at our roads and how much money do we spend to expand roads and expand roads in order to fit all the single occupancy cars? Uh, and what could we do for bus systems? And then we look in Vermont and there's not a lot of places other than that Route 7 corridor that Jane talked about and the I-89 corridor down to Montpelier and maybe Route 2 and Route 15 a little bit north and, and east of Burlington. But we do have a critical mass challenge on mass transportation. And the question is, how do we keep improving this? Do we improve it with uh, more park and rides and better carpooling opportunities? Do we improve it with public transportation? We, in some places. Um, and, uh, and I think these are tough nuts to crack in a state like Vermont, where we have a development pattern that is very dispersed. We don't have concentrated tall development. We have houses all through the countryside and that makes it much harder, uh, but it's, it's a critical piece. You know, we know that carbon emissions from vehicles are, you know, 40 odd percent of our trends of our emissions in the state. We know that agriculture is a huge piece. Um, I will say that, you know, the diesel engine certainly helps on my farm uh, get a lot of work done. That would be human labor. That is really hard. Uh, and a number of farms have looked to try to make some of their smaller tractors 
battery operated and, and electro and electronic uh, electric and it's it's hard but it's doable so people are looking at this in in lots of different ways in our society great thank you both and everyone watching thanks for tuning in and please remember that you can post questions live for us or comments that you have and we'll see those on our end as well and, and can respond and speak to that so please please do that and thanks for joining us here today um so yeah, again, we have Burlington City Councilor Jane Stromberg with us and Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman um, and current candidate for governor. Um, so- How about you, Jack? What and, got and you my, interested? And myself, Since yeah. Since we're the other panelists, we all have to moderate together, so. Exactly, yeah. We Our, our host today had some technical difficulties, so we're, we're, uh, we're gonna co-host and co-moderate um, at the same time and, and be guests at the same time. So yeah, my name's Jack Hansen. I'm with Sustainable Transportation Vermont and I'm also a city councilor in Burlington. Um, and for me, just to answer our initial question of how we got interested in sustainable transportation. So yeah, I grew, I grew up in a pretty, you know, walkable and bikeable and transit friendly community, right? Evanston, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. And, so growing up, I would usually walk to school or, or bike to school with my friends. And um, once I turned 16, I was like the first one of my friends to get my license um, and start driving. And I did that really right when I was 16 because, you know, I didn't really view walking and biking as this bigger picture solution. I just viewed it as a day to day way to get around and, and nothing more and nothing less. So I was I was pretty excited to be able to drive as well. And um, it seemed easier and quicker than than walking and biking everywhere. And so I remember when I got my license, I was one of the first of my friends and they were always, that was kind of, of annoying that people were always, you know, trying to get rides for me and stuff like that. But overall it was like, I was glad to have my license, but then like a year or two after that, as I became more deeply aware and deeply concerned about the climate crisis and just realizing how little was being done to address it, I started to shoulder more of that burden myself and realize that we all had to, to really do our part and play a role and, and address this. And it wasn't, it wasn't a problem that was gonna work itself out or fix itself and we had to be active. So then I started to rethink and then I actually started to kind of go back to my previous habits of, of walking and biking everywhere. And um, I've tried to really stick with that sort of ever since then, ever since my, my senior year of high school. Um, and not only in my personal life, but also on a policy level advocating um, for better infrastructure and better options. So that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is um, state level and, and local level policy that that um, can address transportation challenges. So that's kind of that's going to be our next question, um, and really just try to think about it from a high level. We're gonna we'll have an opportunity to dig in more more to specific policies um, after this, but just to kick things off from a high level, um, what do you both see as some of the key policies that are going to be necessary? at the state and local level in Vermont to shift our transportation system. And again, you don't have to get super in the weeds, but just from a high level, some of the big areas. Um, and we'll start with, um, we'll start with Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. Sure, I, I think there's a number of things that all fit into this mold. And some of it is a conversation of what can we do immediately? And the other is what can we do with policies to encourage our development patterns to get more um, conducive to walkable communities, uh, the amenities that people need in most of their daily lives within a closer distance, and then maybe broader spaces between that are um, not necessarily sort of one house on every 10 or 12 acres spread all over the state. And in some aspects, you know, that's really scary for some because it means, wait, are you gonna tell me what I can do with my land or not? And, you know, I don't think we necessarily need to create a uh, one size fits all model and it's all top down from the state. But the state does have a lot of areas where we incentivize certain patterns and we um, disincentivize certain patterns. So I would like to see us do more towards incentivizing future patterns of growth in our village and town centers. You know, if we have, uh, you know, denser housing 
where people then have a critical mass that you then have enough people for a store to be in town and a coffee shop to be in town and a restaurant or two to be in town. And a lot more folks in, in a more frequent basis could use walkable uh, modes of transportation to get to their what they need to do. Um, I also think we need to think about broadband. Broadband is a form of transportation. Right now, we are all together, and yet we're not. And I think about what we're learning during the COVID crisis, where we can certainly function this way. I don't think it's the way we all want to function. I think we do want to see each other far more frequently as humans. Um, but there's a lot of workplace situations where people could commute three days a week and maybe work from home two days a week. And not only would that reduce emissions by a significant amount, but it would also give people back half an hour, 45 minutes, twice a day of time. And I think we all feel so harried for time. So when we think about transportation as being so many more things than just getting from A to B, but it's time that we're taking getting somewhere, it's the emissions, it's leaving our community to be somewhere else, which means we can't be a volunteer fire squad on it or EMS in our community. Um, so I, I try to break down some of these barriers of thinking to, to tie it all together. And, um, you know, try to put some of those pieces together. Great, great, thank you. And we do have a bunch of questions coming in as well. So we'll try to get through our, our initial questions pretty quickly and kind of get to the questions that are being submitted. So yeah, Councillor Stromberg, just from a high level, just a few policies that you think are really important at the state and local level to help the transition to a sustainable transportation system. Yeah, thanks. Um, David, wow, you made some really good points and I think COVID is truly a, a good example of our potential and, and what we can do under, under pressure as a society, unfortunate terms, but still very realistic. Um, so heating and transportation in our state are our biggest emission sources and, and even agriculture, honestly. Um, and so clearly all of those sectors are incredibly important to Vermonters and our way of life. And um, I think that it, it is important that we do take a high level approach because different municipalities are going to need certain alterations and certain necessities met. Um, but I do think it's incredibly important that we address this sooner rather than later. And um, some things that I think can be a statewide um, approach or goal is like that decoupling of, of parking with the costs of living. And um, I think that it's important that we're not assuming that we have to make accommodating space for cars and things like that. So like normalizing not providing an abundance of parking would be my biggest goal um, for a multitude of reasons that I will probably get into a little later. Um, but I think that Vermont, we look at it like we have so much space and our default is like, how can we add, how can we use that space? Um, and mm -hmm. David really touched on one of my main points is that urbanization. I'm not a city girl. <laughs> I don't feel like I want to live in like a big city like New York City or anything like that. But there is that inherent benefit of incentivizing folks to live more close together so we don't have to be commuting so often and so long to and from work. Um, and also just in general, I think that the less land that we take up for our own space and our own purposes that are not necessary necessities um, is incredibly important um, as we move forward and actually try and grow our economy here, but also just growing our population as that will naturally happen. Um, so those are super high level things, but I think very important themes of today. Thanks. Great. No, I, I really appreciate all that. And you just made me think of, we have an article on stvt.org by one of the co-founders, Julie Campoli, and the article is about walking. And the, the photo in the article is really striking. I, it's from probably around 100 years ago. Um, it's in Rutland. It's the streets of Rutland with tons of pedestrians in the streets. like. It looks like the streetscape of New York City or something. It's just packed with people walking in Rutland, Vermont, you know, almost 100 years ago. So it doesn't have to be a mega city like New York. You can have in Vermont, we've had these small village and town centers that where you can still really have walkable, close knit, tight communities um, on a smaller scale. And, and so we know this is possible. 
Um, and I would, I would agree with a lot of what's been said in terms of where are we investing our resources? Because you look at a place like Rutland today, and it is a lot of like sprawling parking lots that disconnect the community, make it less walkable, and make it really easy to to drive everywhere. And so we've kind of shifted the landscape in many places so that it's really only usable by car, and it's really catered towards the car rather than someone on foot or on a bike. So. I think it has a lot to do with how are we allocating space and money? Where, how do we make housing more affordable um, in, in more walkable communities or transit, transit oriented communities? Um, so yeah, I think you both hit on some really great topics there and telecommuting of course, being a huge shift that we're seeing right now. Um, so I do wanna get to, we, are, we do have some questions coming in. Um, I guess one, one other question before we jump to those that are coming in is if there was one policy that you think could have an impact on sustainable transportation that you want to make more folks aware of, that maybe not a lot of folks are aware of, and that you'd really like to use this opportunity to get folks thinking more about and get them engaged on, um, what might that be? And either of you that has an idea can start, or if you're still thinking of one, I, I can kick that off. I don't mind hopping in if Go ahead. that's all right Go with ahead. you too. Um, I guess I I feel like things are so intertwined, so I might mention a few things, but I want everyone to know that it's all part of like that bigger process. Um, so I think statewide, like in a perfect world, we have statewide fare free transit. Um, I think that would be a game changer and a half. Um, I would also want to see kind of with that more like EV charging stations for electric vehicles um, and more of like just in general, the compensation of workplaces compensating for public commuting if it's not fare free, um, but ideally fare free transit. I think that's a huge, huge goal that we should all have. And I think it doesn't matter what your political ideologies are. I think that it's an incredibly beneficial thing for every single one of us even if it's something that we were not utilizing um it's it's an opportunity that should always be in the background um because that has to do with accessibility has to do with affordability um and i think that just kind of centering those decisions around vulnerable populations and 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 our marginalized populations i think is incredibly important at this point in time because we've seen so many issues in our country alone being like highlighted to s such a degree that it's like we're beyond time sensitivity um so that's one thing and then or one of few, many things um i think another thing is in general we need to incentivize just getting folks out of their cars um because the problem with that like the problem with us owning individual vehicles and things like that is that we are taking up space our car is constantly taking up space on concrete or, or blacktop, what have you, all, at all times. And for me, that's incredibly valuable space where we could have greenery, where we could have solar panels, where we could have like naturally permeable surfaces. And and that's important too, because our the natural biological process that it takes for water to cleanse itself and, and re-enter into the water table and go in, back into the lake, um, that's incredibly necessary for our for our sustainability as a state, but just as for us as human beings on this planet. And so when we have constantly just laying blacktop and concrete around, we are inevitably changing that natural um, process. And so I think that, again, these things are a, a lot of a lot of words coming at you, but I think it's so intertwined because it all has to do with incentivizing that the the limiting usage of of individual vehicles and taking up that space. Thank no, you. that's that's great. I appreciate that, and definitely here in Burlington, we deal a lot with stormwater runoff issues, um, and we spend a whole lot of money on it. And our lake suffers the consequences, and our our economy does too when when our lakes polluted. Um, so that I'm really glad you raised that interconnection. Um, so Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman, yeah, one, one policy that you'd really want to highlight for folks that people aren't aware of. Well, I was going to add a little thought to Jane's first, which is mm -hmm. we are also learning during this sort of COVID moment that a lot of restaurants are utilizing parking areas in front of their restaurants 
at least during the time of year when we can be outdoors, for that outdoor seating uh, and outdoor mm -hmm. eating. I mean, you look at Church Street, which is year-round, of course, but they don't always have outdoor seating year-round. But other uh, businesses and hospitality, um, that outdoor space ended up being pretty critical uh, to their being able to stay at least treading water, maybe. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a transportation expert. I would often lean on people as I will as governor for um, their innovative and creative ideas. I do think fair free transit is a, is a big one because um, at this point, I think in many systems prior to COVID, the fares are only amounting to 15 or 20, 25% of the expense of running the system anyway. And uh, along with fare free, I wonder whether or not there can be, you know, designated lanes on our larger roadways for uh, multi-person vehicles, including the buses, you know, where at times during rush hour, getting in and out of Burlington, for instance, is a slow, tedious process. And uh, if there was one lane that was for buses or vehicles with three or four people, um, and we started dropping the number of vehicles because people saw these buses going by while they're sitting there not moving, um, they might think of, joining on at a park and ride farther upstream and reducing that amount of, uh, of vehicle traffic coming into the city. Uh, you know, there's a, a chicken and egg where you need enough people willing to do it to make it time effective and, and cost effective. But I also think it's really important. We don't, we are, we just don't really always think about all the costs involved. You know, we forget, I mean, we, we get frustrated by gas taxes but we ultimately just fill the tank and fill the tank and fill the tank. And um, all that money is going towards paving and a little bit of alternative transportation. But imagine if you could fill your tank, you know, one fewer times a month because you were taking a bus. How much money is that? And then, sure, if your taxes went up by $10 a month, you'd probably be saving more than 10 a month in transportation costs by not filling your tank and taking that bus, you know, two days a week. Um, things like that. So mm -hmm. we often are very immediate in the cost situation without really thinking about how when we pool our resources, we can sometimes save all of ourselves um, some of those dollars. So, uh, you know, those are some, some topics I would think would be important. Absolutely. Great. So we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left and we do have a lot of questions that are coming in that I want to get to really quickly. I would say for me, just a policy to highlight um, transportation demand management which is basically rather than addressing the supply side of things, so building more parking to accommodate people driving somewhere, you address the demand side and actually reduce the number of vehicles as we've been talking about. And I think large employers especially have a really big role to play in this rather than just subsidizing and spending money in order to give away free, free parking that actually costs the employer money. Um, trying to subsidize alternative forms of transportation and reduce the need for all of that, that parking. Um, so let's see, I'll go to a question from Jacob Weinstein. Um, he's a senior at UVM and he says, David, thanks for joining us. If you get elected and Amtrak is still not running, will you do everything in your power to restart service? Yeah, Jacob, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm a Vermont representative. I'm the one that has signed on to a policy discussion group out of Boston talking about uh, Amtrak and train service. Uh, people who follow train issues know that Boston is very curious because there's North Station and South Station and they're not quite connected, uh, which would really open up so much uh, more potential for ridership. Uh, there's also work being done on the western side of the state in Middlebury right now and up the west side of the of the link to um, make that rail line better. And there's conversations and I think forward motion on issues around the rail line on the waterfront going into um, uh, into Essex and, and connecting some of those lines. So we definitely have to continue moving forward in either retrofitting, rebuilding, upgrading our lines to make this more accessible from Montreal to Albany and down to New York, there's huge potential for um, economic opportunity and uh, reduction in, in emissions and travel. Again, think about it. If you're interested in going to New York City, 
and you've got a family and you're going to go down for the weekend, you could be in a car where you're really immobile. And now most vehicles have screens for kids because, you know, when I was a kid, we used to like bounce around the back seats together and wrestle and be really annoying and dangerous. Um, and now you're strapped in. And so there's more and more screen time. Well, if you're on a train, you can sit with your family, you know, face to face at a table, you can play cards, you can talk in, you know, in ways that's harder in a vehicle. Um, and no one has to be driving. You could get computer work done. You could read a book. Um, so I think trains and public transportation really open up a lot of other opportunities for people that um, we don't always comprehend until you do it. Great. Great. Thank you. And then we have another question for Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman. So this is from um, V-Bike. Um, and V-Bike is um, dedicated to getting Vermonters out of cars whenever and wherever possible. And specifically, they focus on electric bikes and electric cargo bikes um, to help people travel further distances, climb hills, um, use that cargo bed for to put groceries or even bring kids to school and things like that. Um, and so V-Bike has said, Vermont is beginning to lead the way with e-bike rebates, low interest bike loans. Many of our bike shops are shifting towards e-bikes and V-Bike is providing free bike consultations for Vermonters along with local motion. We see this as a low hanging fruit opportunity. Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman, um, are you aware of these developments and do you have a vision for increasing and developing bike mobility in Vermont? Well, I, I'm not overly familiar, so it's helpful to learn. I do remember back when I was at UVM biking through the winter and snowstorms, and it was always a bit tricky uh, and at times dangerous um, just from a traction perspective. Although now some of the newer bikes with those massive tires, I think there's probably um, better traction and opportunity there. Although, you know, we do live in a climate that can be easier and can be harder depending on the time of year and the weather. Um, but no, I think those are, are great options and opportunities. Uh, again, you know, people are sometimes restricted by our memories. And my memory is, you know, two wheels on a bike and me pedaling hard and thinking, how much can I fit in my backpack? And now with electric bikes, whether they've got panniers or a trailer, uh, trailer the capacity is really different. Um, I do remember living in Burlington with a little bike trailer for my, you know, daughter when she was born. Um, and it was, it was both really amazing and really scary because it was wider. We would go in the street and there's my daughter, you know, a one and two year old kid in a trailer in a road with cars. And, um, so I think we also have to make sure as we expand the opportunities of using bikes, we continue to expand car driver awareness, um, mm -hmm. and make sure, you know, lanes are, are wide enough and available. Um, so I think it's really exciting, some of these possibilities. The other part has to do with electricity and where's the electricity coming from. Um, way back, uh, I was on the Burlington Electric Light Department or, or BED um, board. And many homes in Vermont, in Burlington, had been electric heat. And then there had been big incentives to move away from electric heat because it was really inefficient to moving towards carbon-based heat. And then now we're going back towards you know, different kinds of electric now that we have better forms of electric generation that are more sustainable. Um, although still a lot of our electric generation is from massive hydro like Hydro Quebec. So I think we have to remember that any form of energy being used um, is imperfect, uh, but it does sound exciting with these electric bikes. Now we just need to make sure we install more solar panels on our homes and on our uh, business roofs and in carports where there are cars so that we have better forms of uh, energy production to then feed those uh, V-bikes. Great, great. So I'm gonna, um, just for time's sake and to keep the conversation moving, I'm gonna combine two of the questions. So we have a question from Matthew LaFleur that was directed at um, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman and we had a question from Brenda Siegel that was more general. So we can, I'm gonna address both of those and we can open it up. So Matthew LaFour's question was, as a person with learning and developmental disability, how has 
Vermont's next governor, um, would you ensure that all people with disabilities get the transportation services that they need? That's one question. And then our, the second question was Brenda Siegel um, speaking to um, public transportation and universal broadband and the benefits, especially to low income folks and low income parents in particular. Um, and Brenda is, is talking about, um, you know, as we begin to test microtransit, I think I'm going to read her comment. I think that poses some issues for disability community in places where public transit currently exists, like Montpelier, where we are testing microtransit now, um, but would be really beneficial in rural communities. How do you think we can expand, begin to expand some of these models um, to rural communities for those who do not live? in those communities um, so that we can begin to shift both the culture and also address real problems for low-income Vermonters in rural communities while addressing our climate issues. So those are two, two questions about sort of transportation access um, for low-income folks, for rural folks, um, working parents, and folks with disabilities. Um, so does either of you want to address that first or I can speak to it? Or? Yeah, let's hear your thoughts. So your moderator and panelists, I, but uh, I can, certainly there's yeah, more I to can, add. Yeah. I can chime in a little bit. I think this micro transit conversation I think is a really good one for Vermont of sort of using smaller vehicles like vans and, and shared vehicles that are more sort of on demand and more flexible with their routes than the typical, you know, larger buses that are on a fixed route. So I think I'm glad that we are expanding micro transit in Vermont. And I know there is, as Brenda Siegel mentioned, there's a pilot program in Montpelier to, to really test that out. And I'm eager to see how that works. And I agree with Brenda that um, we need to do more to, to expand this into rural communities. And I know there's a really good model um, that I had the opportunity to learn about once in, in the islands um, in Grand Isle, where it's a volunteer driver program that's specifically trying to support folks with limited um, transportation access. And I know they've found a lot of success there. So I think we have to continue with these pilots and continue proving it out and, and getting better. But ultimately I do think microtransit is gonna be a great solution for Vermonters, especially with reaching folks who, who lack access. Um, and I think the intersection between transportation access and folks with disabilities is pretty big in terms of sustainable transportation as well, because public transit is, um, it's really the most accessible form of transportation that we have to people with all, all differing abilities. Um, so I, I'm really glad that folks are bringing that into discussion. I think there's a lot more we can do to increase that access. Um, do others want to, to speak on this at all? Well, certainly, um, I know some of the question was sort of specifically directed at me. And, you know, we know as a society, um, we, we have to make sure that folks with different abilities and challenges uh, to mobility or, or getting around, um, it's really a reflection on our, on our broader common set of values that we need to make sure people have access to the services and, and basic needs and ability to get to work uh, that they need. And, you know, it's extremely hard um, in Vermont in some respects because we are, again, so geographically dispersed. But if we have a system with either micro transit and maybe fixed routes that also operate with, you know, micro transit hubs around to make sure people can get um, to those larger routes so that if you are in a, a distinctly rural area, you could get to a main line that could get you to the bigger areas um, would be an ideal. You know, that's that's really, we have to have ideals. We have to have goals. We have to have vision of what we would like to see happen so that we then know what the benchmark is on when we finally achieve what would be considered a, a just and civil society, both from an environmental perspective with transportation and emissions, but also from a social values and social contract perspective with all members of our community. Uh, and so that I think touches on Brenda's question as well, you know, uh, valuing everybody, you know, 
whether you're a single mom or you're a quote, uh, you know, traditional family, which, you know, we are obviously are having much broader conversations around that as well, um, because what does that really mean? Uh, and that, um, you know, everyone who is who is working to get through their day, raise their family if they have a family or not if they don't, but being a participant in society, no matter what their circumstances, is something that we need to be considering as we develop transportation policies and public transportation policies and accessibility. It's a huge issue. Absolutely. I really, really appreciate all of that. Um, so we are coming up on time here. Um, so I would just ask if either of you has any final thoughts that you'd like to share before we sign off. And I just want to thank everyone who's tuned in and thank both of our guests for, for joining us. So any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I am very excited that we're in this space today and also just um, pushing for this conversation at all levels of government. Um, I think one thing I just want to, and I echo entirely everything that David had just said, um, with that, I want to mention that we need to support people. And if people don't feel supported, they're going to leave. And um, I think that that has tendrils into every aspect of society. Um, we need to be making decisions not based on class, race, sex, any type of discrimination. And I think that that's something that we have to constantly bring into every topic, every conversation that we have, regardless of transportation, heating, agriculture, what have you. Um, and so I, I'm very much a supporter of moving in this direction and moving as fast as possible because we are in a climate crisis. It doesn't, we don't wake up every day going, like, oh my God, it's emergency. And like that bothers me because I don't wake up every day doing that either, but I know how incredibly important it is. Um, and so I wanna see really um, meaningful and radical change, but done in a responsible way where we are not leaving out even one person, because that's the problem. If we leave out somebody, we're not doing our jobs. And we happen to be in these privileged um, positions of power and being able to make these decisions. And we, it is our job to be as inclusive as humanly possible. That is why I got involved in politics in the first place. So I am incredibly happy and honored to have this conversation with all of you. And I want to continue it through and through. So thank you. Great. Thank you, City Burlington City Councilor for Ward 8, Jane Stromberg. Thanks so much for joining us. And Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, did you have final thoughts that you wanted to share? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that uh, continue to use your voice, um, or anybody who's watching, that uh, voting is critically important, but it's not the only part of participating in building our democracy and building our society. Uh, so obviously, I hope everyone does vote. Uh, and you can reach out to any number of candidates out there, look at our websites, make your decisions, think, think deeply about the whole picture, not just what's happening in one moment in time, uh, but also reach out to elected officials who are making these decisions. Uh, you know, you've got two city councilors here, you current lieutenant governor, we'll see what happens after November 3rd, I might be your next governor, um, but reach out uh, to your councilors, to your legislators, to your board of alder people, to your school boards, and add your voice to the conversation and add your expertise. Um, I can't remember the name of the person with V-Bikes. Uh, um, Dave Cohen. Yeah, you know, I'm mm -hmm. sure you are involved and that's great. And what we need is people that have more knowledge than, than us. You know, I don't know about a lot of these things, but I know a little bit about lots of things, but those with expertise need to be brought to the table to really help shape these conversations going forward. And we need to bring people in with different perspectives. You know, if you are having a conversation with only people that completely agree with you, then you're probably missing something. And we all need to be more tolerant and more aware of the different places people are coming from and the different perspectives they have. Uh, and some of us are in a more privileged position to be able to be more tolerant, but we need to hear where folks are coming from so we can figure out where we're gonna go together rather than just, you know, when we talk about, Jane talked about leaving people out. Leaving people out can also be leaving people out with a different perspective. And we need to make sure they are also included in these conversations. Great. Thank you for that. To our other guest, um, Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman and current candidate for Vermont governor. Um, 
And just to close this out, yeah, thanks again, everyone who joined and everyone who asked questions. And please, as we said, keep this discussion going. Um, I know all three of us are accessible and you can find our contact info and we're always happy to engage. And whoever your elected officials are, please have these conversations and share your perspective. There's a lot of changes happening in our transportation system right now. And so it's a really good time to, to share your thoughts and to engage in that conversation as we really shift in so many ways with transportation and, and really everything during this COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you to both of our guests. Thanks to all of you and have a great re weekend, everybody, and stay dry. Take thank care. you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody.